Hi, guys. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session, uh, an open session, what would you do differently? So the people in the room, the people in chat, will all discuss what we don't like about our setups or what we might have done differently. Uh, that's the general topic tonight. But yes, we're going to have a few asides because I've ha uh, had already gotten some emails uh, on specific questions. And I believe they were brought up at the end of the session last week. And I said I would cover them. So I will. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, before we do that, I do want to show off this week's image of the week. Uh, and this is a cool one. This uh, image is uh, the Antennae Galaxy Collision by Rick Babcock. Uh, and of course, this is NGC 4038 and 4039 um, taken with an 8-inch RC. Uh, I don't know if uh, well, most of the people watching have probably seen the amazing Hubble image of this. Um, that's nicely done. It's very nice, yeah. And that's the Hubble, right? So uh, to see an amateur do this nice of a job on it, really impressive. This is a really small object. Um, and uh, just looking at it, uh, he, I, 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 I'm not trying to knock his gear at all, but he did it with, you know, uh, what is it, uh, 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 a millionth the price of the Hubble telescope. Uh, it just amazes me that uh, amateurs can take images like this. And um, it's one of those reasons that I'm, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine at this point to see uh, Hubble images used over amateur images in, in some circumstances. Uh, and, and I'm trying to think of an example. Um, I don't know, basically in sky and telescope and, and all of that, they, they can rely on a lot of amateur images. Uh, yes, those Hubble images really help you see what's there, but I don't know, I'm blown away by what we could do from our driveways. Uh, okay, image of the week down. Let's see here, get my screen back. And of, of course, as always, uh, Check out our website to see these in um, full resolution and to comment on them. Um, second thing I'm going to say before we start, next week, Warren Keller is going to be back on. And Warren Keller is a master processor in PixInsight, probably one of the first people to, uh, uh, what, uh, to I'll say, use it and really broadly share his uh, knowledge on it. And he's probably now at this point, uh, if you use PixInsight, you know Warren, um, whether it's from his book or from his Astro, uh, uh, his uh, uh, videos that he, uh, that he sells, uh, it's kind of a subscription series uh, that basically teaches you PixInsight. And uh, if you've, uh, if you've never used PixInsight and you're coming to it to the, for the first time, um, stare at the console for a little bit and then buy Warren's book or his uh, videos because it's going to save you a lot of time. Um, okay, and I see actually that one of the people who asked the questions today is in the room. Uh, so I'm going to cover the questions first. Uh, we had a very quick discussion on this particular question because I wanted to make sure I was on the same page as some of the other people um, as I scan the comments. Uh, so um, Joe uh, Vitaccio uh, has a great interest in planetary imaging, uh, lives close to Washington, D.C., but has a great rooftop. Uh, if space and size were not, if space size and portability were not issues, he'd buy an eight to ten inch SCT. Uh, but his primary concern is portability and buying his first scope, uh, and that the mount be manageable for him, uh, for him to be able to move to the roof of his apartment building, um, is basically his primary concern. Uh, he's thinking about going with SVT 102 and a GM8. Uh, when he buys a house and uh, could set up equipment and leave it out. His, his setup might be differently. Um, for portability, weight, weight capacity, accuracy of tracking, are there other mounts one might look at for long-term portable, portable setup? Uh, how much degradation of the image will you have with a high-quality APO and PowerMate? 
And are there other camera companies uh, one should look at in addition to ZWL? So there's actually a lot of questions there to cover. And I am going to preface this by saying that uh, our primary focus on the astro imaging channel is it tends to be deep sky astro imaging, uh, which um, takes uh, which is uses specific gear that you may not use and which has different requirements from the gear that you would use for planetary. Uh, the camera that I would pick for planetary imaging would not be the camera that I would pick for deep sky imaging. At the same time, the, tele, uh, the OTA, the optical tube that I would pick for planetary imaging probably wouldn't be the same uh, that I would pick for deep sky imaging. All of that said, I'm gonna try and go, by, uh, go down these point by point. Um, so you live in Washington, DC, so I, I'm thinking that your primary concern is gonna be light pollution. Uh, here's the good thing about that, uh, planetary imaging, light pollution is not a big factor. For deep sky imaging, it's a huge factor and you want to drive as far as you can away from the lights. But for planetary imaging, it, it just is not a factor. Uh, I, maybe the best planetary imagers out there might say, oh, it, it could be a little bit of a factor, but uh, honestly, I've seen people take great planetary images uh, from, I don't know, the most heavily light polluted areas around. Seeing, on the other hand, is a factor. And you probably don't have the best seeing, but your seeing is probably about as good as uh, most of the other people that are posting planetary images you'll see on the forums. There are gonna be some guys that get lucky that live in that perfect area and really put out amazing uh, images, but um, uh, Light pollution, not a factor. Seeing could be a factor, particularly when you're getting beyond those first few images and trying to constantly improve your uh, your images. Uh, but let's get to the gear. Uh, so if space and portability weren't an issue, you would go with an 8, in, eight to 10 inch SCT. And I believe that you've had a negative experience, yeah, from your follow-up email, you had a negative experience with a um, six inch SCT. And the first thing that I want to say is uh, a lot of people have had bad experiences with six inch SCTs for imaging. Um, they are okay visual scopes. They're pretty good for outreach due to portability, uh, but for a critical either observer or um, imager, uh, I think that there's just too much obstruction. Uh, I'm not going to say it's poorly designed, because uh, it is really an amazing piece of gear for what it pulls off in such a small package, but um, it isn't probably up to the same standards that we would like to see. So I would try not to uh, use that, ex uh, I would try not to take that um, experience into account when you're talking about the eight inch SCTs. The other thing you discussed was the portability of the, eight, uh, the SVT-102 versus the eight inch SCT. And my immediate thought was, was the SCT, the 8-inch SCT, really much bigger than the SVT-102? You're talking about a 4-inch refractor, which is going to take up a, a decent amount of space. Um, uh, yes, uh, in, in cubes terms, you're probably a little bit smaller, but the... Um, the uh, uh, the fact that the SCT can kind of stand up on the on, on its side in the closet, or uh, the refractor may not be able to lie down in the closet. I don't know. Is it much smaller? I, to me, the eight inch SCT kind of seems to be about the same portability. GMA hey, hey, now. Adam? Yes, yeah. go ahead. I've been looking up the specs on the SV one hundred two versus like the eight inch Edge HD. Right. The eight inch. 8-inch HD is like $1,300. The SV-102 is uh, $2,200. Mm -hmm. uh, the the SV-102 is almost 14 pounds once you include a dovetail plate in the rings. Uh, and the 8-inch SCT is about 14 pounds as well. Um, the 8-inch SCT is 17 inches long, and I think the... Uh, SV-102 is 19 and a quarter. Um, so it's a little bit longer. They're almost the same weight. Um, 
I think that's without any flattener or anything in the SV-102 and the eight inch edge has it built in. Um, so in my, my book at least, if, if you're mostly interested in planetary and visual, the eight inch is a much better system for that. Yep. And that's, my, I think, go ahead, Alex. Um, remember that the GM-8 is named because it was made to hold the good old Celestron-8. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it did, let's put it this way. It can certainly hold it. For photographic purposes, you want a lot more precision in the way the mount works. But here we've got somebody asking us specifically about taking pictures of planets. Yeah, right? And if we're talking about pictures of planets, the a lot of the advice that we hand out so freely about the mount is absolutely critical and stuff. A lot of that stuff goes by the wayside because you're going to be probably using a video-based camera as opposed to a long exposure type of camera. By video-based camera, I mean that it's taking uh, 15 to 30 frames per second and uh, you're going to take two minutes of video and then you're going to uh, stack them together in Registrax or something like that. And boom, that's that's what you're going to do. Um, but and so the demands you have on the mount are not nearly as stringent. Now, which of these are more portable? Frankly, I'd rather be carrying around a refractor than an SCT. But if I were going to be specifically taking pictures of um, planets, I would want as much focal length as I can get. And I simply cannot get that much focal length out of a refractor. Um, but out of a SCT, I would have that 2000 millimeter focal length that's in the standard eight inch SCT. And I would put a Barlow on it and bump it up to 4000. And now I'm starting to talk about taking some detailed planetary images, perhaps. So um, I, I think that if you've decided that you're going to be taking planetary pictures, um, then you need to worry about getting focal length rather than anything else. Like I said, I'd rather, if I were carrying something around, carry a small refractor than carry something with that big old um, uh, corrector plate on the front that I'm always worried about is going to break or something like that. So. That's where I would come from on giving you advice, um, assuming that you want advice for planetary, okay? I'll, I'll add one other thing to that, Alex, which is that the eight inch is nearly double the aperture. And if you're doing yeah. uh, lucky imaging, that actually does count for a fair amount. Yeah. Uh, uh, even the if you get the focal length up on that SV-102, the aperture does make a difference there. Yeah, the wider the aperture is, the the um, a Raleigh criteria, which is uh, eventually what determines what your um, uh, ultimate resolution can be, uh, goes dramatically up. You can get smaller, uh, you can get more resolution out of a larger aperture. Yes, and I think that's why I uh, kept pressing that issue uh, where um, if it's only a little bit bigger, the 8-inch SET is so much better at what you're trying to do specifically. Um, nothing wrong with a high-quality Apo, but I think, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of planetary imagers out there using 8-inch SETs, 10-inch uh, uh uh and 9 and, what is it, 9 and a quarter inch SETs, 11-inch uh, SETs. Um, so it, it's, it's a system that's really good at doing that and visual, uh, second part of your question that I want to address, and I'm actually not certain on this. Um, you are going to be imaging from the top of your apartment building and I'm wondering exactly how tall your apartment building is, but I don't know if this actually comes into fact, uh, if this becomes a factor with planetary, I'm inclined to say it doesn't. Uh, but if you were imaging from the top of an apartment, if you were deep sky imaging from the top of an apartment building, uh, your building sway might cause some issues um, or any vibrations that run through it. Um, I, I honestly don't know if that's the case with planetary imaging. Um, 
but it's one of those things where if you did have Im uh, issues popping up, I might be inclined to say, take it off the rooftop. Uh, anyone in the room know about that? It, it really depends on just how much movement there is, right? You, you know, because if you if your planet drifts out of the field continually because of movement of, of the building in one way or other, then it's not useful, right? Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise, the fast motion. I mean, you're, you're we're taking frames at you know in millisecond time frames, right? So the amount of exposure that you're getting on, you know, is just this tiny slice of time window. So any kind of movement of the air is basically going to be frozen uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. So the movement of the building is not the problem in terms of the video you're capturing. It's more whether or not it stays in the field of view. Um, I have been in, I, I'm just trying to think in my brain how many times I've been on a, a rooftop or a porch or a something where my, um, where the instrument that I'm looking through is not fastened to the ground. And um, I have always been able to tell when somebody's walking around. And if I can tell when they're walking around or any one of a number of other things, just I, I, I see that there is a lot of movement. And I agree with David that if you're taking, you know, 15, 30 frames per second, uh, you might be stopping some of the vibrations. But um, no, I think you're getting enough vibrations no matter when, what, when you're sitting on top of a building. Now, it's possible. And I really advocate that if that's all you've got, go take some pictures. You know, I mean, use what you got and take advantage of whatever situation you can rather than sit there and wish you could be an astro imager. But just be ready for the fact that you would probably be getting better pictures if you were to get someplace where it was absolutely solid. There are some things that you can do to contain those vibrations. Um, one of them are the one of them is variations of the sorbethane pads. Um, uh, you can pay about fifty or sixty bucks for them, or you can get them for maybe three or four bucks per chunk. Sorbethane is S O R B A T H A N E, uh, and it's a type of rubbery plastic. I don't know what it is exactly, but it's a uh, it, you know, put some hockey pucks under it, basically, is what it's like, um, so that the, it absorbs the motion before it gets up to your scope. And those kinds of things will help. Um, I know that there are uh, astroimagers, particularly planetary astroimagers, that get a lot of benefit. They, they do image from their, um, from their, uh, not their, what, their balconies and things like that. So, so it can be done. <coughs> Just be ready for the fact that you're going to have to do something about those vibrations. Also, um, Adam, did you notice that I think who's the fellow that we're actually responding to down here? He's got down towards the end. He said um, eventually that he would like to go to um, to uh, uh, what is it? Where did he write that? Yeah, to, to an that he's not just stuck on planetary. In which case, you just have to make some choices, you know. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. easier to learn deep space astroimaging with a refractor because they're more forgiving. On the other hand, if what you want to do is planetary, what you really want is focal length, and that's the very enemy of the ease of learning um, the deep space imaging. Okay, that's enough for me. Um. And uh, the, the, the better point than vibrations from the building, thermals coming off the building, which actually uh, w could cause issues. Um, what ends up, I mean, they're, they're uh, going to wobble the picture so much. I don't know, the, the frequency of the wobble, uh, I'm trying to think of it in, uh, in deep sky terms, but uh, that, that would probably cause an issue as well. Um, But I'm not the best. I'm not a good planetary imager. I've, I've imaged planetary uh, maybe maybe a dozen times. Um, I've done more solar than planetary, and uh, well, thermal currents I guess are just the way uh, the way of the world with solar. But there are some things you can do to overcome it. Uh, shooting over uh, over water uh, can help. Uh, but uh, every 
every system you have to learn your tricks and techniques. Um, okay, I think I hope I think I hope we covered that question well. It may not be the answer you wanted. Uh, in, in that SVT 102 will treat you really well in the future for deep sky imaging if you try to uh, go further with it. But I'm not sure for planetary, uh, it's it's going to be the the optimal system. Uh, will you have fun with it? Uh, yes. Um, is it exactly what you're asking for? Not quite. Um, are there other camera companies one should look at in addition to ZWO? I can't proficiently speak to uh, what's good in planetary cameras. Anyone here uh, make some suggestions? I know I have. Uh, I'm not even sure that it's used as much in planetary as it is in solar, uh, but I have a point gray uh, research camera. Uh, Anyone in the room? I, I use an imaging source, but I, I think that an awful lot of people already have a, probably a pretty good camera that they use to take wedding pictures and baby pictures. Uh, an awful lot of the uh, Canon, I know, and probably other um, DSLRs have a movie mode. And particularly if you can run that movie mode, um, I forget what the name of the frame is, but it just takes the central part of the picture. And um, I, I, that's it's getting awfully darn good right there. And you can do it today. You know, you don't have to wait to buy a $700 camera or something like that. Um, and if you're asking, are there any qu uh, companies besides ZWO? Um, well, yeah, there's lots of companies. Um, I use an imaging source camera. I think did I mentioned that. Um, uh, so that there are many, many other cameras out there. Um, and I, I'm not familiar enough with all of them to say which ones you'd really like or which ones you're going to get something out of. So, you know, one one uh, thing that popped up. First of all, someone has a ZWO that they say it's it's a great camera for planetary. Um, the uh, one thing that's pointed out: a lot of the better planetary cameras um, may run at such high frame rates that they're going to require a solid state hard drive. Uh, if you want to get the full frame rate off of it, uh, you've got to be able to write to the hard drive fast enough. Some of them have buffers, I believe, but probably not enough to, to cover it. Uh, I ran into that issue with mine, um, and it's just a it's just a basic older camera, but uh, something to keep in mind. Um, uh, Attic, A T I K, Q H Y, all seem to be very similar. Uh, but another uh, another person vouching for the ZWO, and you're probably reading this in chat, I hope. Uh, <laughs> does anybody have experience using OBT's triad filter for emission nebulae? We discussed it in the past. I don't think anybody here has experience with it. Um, I'm going to buy one and just play with it just to see what it can do. <laughs> this week. I'll let you know. Cool. Um, oh, yes, he is in chat. I see I am. I didn't quite understand. So I hope that answers your question. Um, if it doesn't, ask, ask uh, some further follow-ups, but uh, make sure uh, I'm going to your follow-up right now. Adam, does it, I mean, even if you use that filter, isn't it still just only using a portion of your pixel? You know, it's, what is it? It's a red, two greens, and a blue. I forget what the combination is on, on an OSC camera. Each so, pixel behind just so many I, uh, I So it, it depends on how you're using it, right? So it has... Um, it passes the light in the three different bands. Is that uh, is that yeah. what it? I wasn't real sure about how. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about it this morning. I was going to buy one just to try to test it out, and uh, but I wasn't sure. I mean, is it? Are you still just robbing yourself of half your pixel? No, I I don't think you would be robbing yourself of any pixels actually with this particular filter because this would act as basically a light suppression filter, uh, just an extremely aggressive light suppression filter that's letting those nebula bands pass um 
Do you Adam, think of that? Adam yes. I, I think when you're talking about robbing um, yourself of photons, you know, the green micro um, filter, if you've got an RGGB matrix, the green light will come through the green, the red light will come through the red, and the blue will come through the blue, no matter what the filter ahead of it is doing. And these filters are meant to be used with a, a color camera, correct? So, right. so yes, I, I think that the phenomena that we're talking about robbing light would still be there. Yeah, um, I would too. Yeah, but I think that we are making a mistake in speculating too much about this. I am just so glad that we found somebody that's got, what is it, 700 bucks? That they, man, I think I'll buy it and see how it works. Yeah, fine, go for it. Uh, I've got a few other investments I'd like you to look into too. Um, uh, it, it seems like it's an awful lot of money for an experiment, but I know that Chris is getting good pictures out of it. So I think we need to get Chris on in here to explain what's the magic about this thing and, um, well, I'm, and why I'm, we should be using it. I'm piggybacking my I'm piggybacking my uh, Williams Optics GT71 on top of my RC8 with a with a little Nikon D5300 I picked up. And I wanted to grab that filter and throw it on there and just see what it can do. You know, I'm, I'm not really, I'm going to have some fun with it. I mean, my, my main interest is on my RC8, but since it's piggybacking, let's see what it can do and, and test it out. You know, maybe I can get some cool stuff out of it. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, go for it. If you're going to buy it, buy it and tell us about it. But I think that we should stop talking. Oh, yeah. I don't, I'm not saying we should stop talking about it. We really don't know what we're talking about. No, I don't, I don't know how they're working the magic. I just but, brought it up because yeah. somebody mentioned it, and I'm I'm saying I'm I'm looking at it right now. I talked to Peter Myers at OPT last week, and I'm going to get one and just test it out, and see what's up. I'll let you know when I get done. Okay, sounds good. But I, I think uh, I as I just think about the filter in theory, right? Um, the it's not the same robbing light issue you would have using an H alpha filter on a yeah that's what I was yes yes not that bad it's it's a different issue it, it, I shouldn't even say issue it's a different phenomena it's uh that you are it's an aggressive light pollution suppression filter right yeah, um, it may uh it, I'm trying to think though H alpha s2 um are both in the reds correct yeah, they're only a few nanometers apart. Yeah. So you're going to use the red pixels on a on the one shot. You only really get like a quarter of your pixel when you shoot a H alpha filter on top of an OSC, uh, you know, matrix or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. So you're going to use, uh, and then the uh, O3. I mean, I'm try I, I honestly don't know. The O3 would probably only hit what the green pixels. I don't know. That's what I was wondering this morning when I was thinking about it. I don't know whether it would hit uh, the blue or the green. If it was a green, you probably have a better benefit due to there being more green pixels. Yeah. But I'm actually not quite the, sure. The about filters that. for DSLRs and the other ones, the Bayer matrix filters, are not sharp cutoff curves. So mm -hmm. the O3 will end up going into both buckets, right? So it will end up in both. You'll also get part of the H beta. Uh, more primarily in the blue than the green, but it would go into a little bit into both. I got you. See, I by, was the, by the way, the filter is three hundred and seventy-five for the buck and a, for the one and a quarter inch. Right. Um, but uh, where where do they have? I was just wondering if it was like a glorified ha filter, you know. And what's the point, you know? I mean, but unless they've somehow figured out a way to put this filter on and use up the pixels to where you you know where you at least get something out of it. I, I, I was going to talk to them some more before I bought it, but I was just thinking about it just to try it, see what it does. A lot of us had discussed uh, or at least showed interest in it just as assuming it had worked this way, a luminance filter for narrow band images. Um, uh, if you're using a monochromatic camera, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I did buy this week that came in and Astrodon uh, makes a Sloan, filter and i bought the eye near infrared and uh i haven't used it yet i just got it in this week but uh i, I can send some images over to you that somebody that has been using it man talk about some beautiful stuff 
that it, it gets the higher points of the ha range and the six to seven hundred ranges but uh it's called a sloan eye and they're 300 bucks and uh i added it to my filter wheel and uh I'll, I'll see me and Chris Gomez are, are working on it right now to see what we can get out of it. Is that the filter that Josh uses? I'm not sure. Um, Josh was doing some really nice infrared stuff. Um, he did a horse head nebula that uh, uh, was almost reminiscent of the newer version of, I hate to mention it, but the Hubble, uh, where the horse head really became the foreground and it wasn't like a hole in the nebula. Uh, it was just this really intense structure yeah it's beautiful what it does the pictures i've seen from it there's there's about four or five of them but it's called a sloan eye is the near infrared one is the one you want to get if you're going to want to add it to your lrgb i still don't know how to add it in but uh i'm gonna shoot it i'll see the i know it takes filters are scientific filters they are uh, photometric um filters that uh the different observatories all use to, so they have comparable data results. But they have an I filter and they have a Z filter. The Z filter is an open-ended um, you know, band pass. So it cuts off uh, around 650 or something like that for the low side, but then is open-ended on the, the far side. And the I filter cuts off again at... Uh, 695, 700, yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah. So it... it it is a true band pass uh, where the uh, Z filter is actually a uh, high pass filter. Uh, I wish I could share um, some images I had that, that's been shot with it. The, the Orion Nebula that I got the other day that was put in with the Sloan Eye is just beautiful. I pulled up the um, website, I guess, at OPT. And uh, if you can, you see what I've got there? Yeah. You can see what is this? O3. Is down. What is it? Five hundred five is 03. Uh, I guess H beta. It must be in this band down here. And then they've got a. It looks like there's an eighteen nanometer band pass in that area. And you're full width at max of the um, band pass, eighteen millimeters. And then it's a three nanometer band pass up in hydrogen alpha, which would mean this is a this is a aqua color in here, bluish greenish. Uh, for that uh, O3H beta, um, and this is obviously the deep red. So that's what you're getting with the triad filter, eh? Uh, what's that mean? I don't know. Somebody's going to buy it and test it and give it back to us. That's great. We'll Very see. The information. We'll see. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh. Moving on to the next question I got from Warren Simison, um, asking about uh, which camera parameter should influence his purchase decision. Pixel size, megapixel rating, pixel array, sensor size, frames per second. His okay. beginning target interests are planets, galaxies, and nebula. Uh, he doesn't know how to evaluate the cameras, and since he has uh, no experience, he'd like some help. Uh, so as you might have heard us say earlier, the cameras that are good at uh, doing, uh, let me preface this, the cameras that are very good or that are specific for deep sky or for spe specific for planetary probably aren't good at doing the opposite. Um, DSLRs kind of do a little bit of both well. And if you have a DSLR or you're just getting your feet wet and want to try a lot of stuff, see what picks your interest, a DSLR could be a good option. That said, dedicated planetary cameras in a lot of cases are cheaper than DSLRs. Dedicated astronomy cameras tend to be more expensive than DSLRs. Uh, it's just the requirements of the actual cameras. Um, so how do you decide which camera you want? Well, I would really say in advance, um, if you're deciding to go with the DSLR, um, first I'll, I'll give a shout out to Jerry Rodriguez. Uh, check out his website and his uh, tutorials because he really walks you through 
DSLR imaging for both planetary and deep sky. If that answer, I don't know how to say it, if that answer doesn't satisfy you, um, there are a lot of very reasonably priced planetary cameras. Uh, yeah, and, and DSLR, I, I shouldn't poo-poo DSLRs at all. They should be a lot, it's more than just for getting your feet wet. Um, and, and it was a bad way of phrasing it. Um, DSLRs are good enough to take amazing planetary and deep sky images with. Um, that said, if, you're, if you've used a DSLR for five to 10 years, eventually uh, you might want to, uh, I'll put quotes on it, upgrade uh, to something that is dedicated and specific for exactly what you wanna do. Uh, deep sky cameras have cooling to bring the sensor temperature down to a specific set point, which makes calibrating and um, uh, a lot of the pre-processing that we do easier. I know a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of talk here that might not be so helpful. Um, but uh, when you're when you ask about pixel size, megapixel rating, pixel array sensor size, frames per second. It's a lot of stuff to think about, but sure, uh, unless you're, if you're not going with the DSLR, you're not gonna have that many options. Um, I, I wouldn't take those, a lot of those specifics into factor um, as much as I would say take just one of them, sensor size. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, Sam, uh, sampling and we want one arc sec per pixel or 0.7 arc secs per pixel some of us have decided on and if you can buy the perfect telescope or the perfect camera that gets you there great um but if you can't doesn't mean you're you you shouldn't buy a camera you still have to buy a camera um there are a lot of cameras out there and What I'll say right now, I think monochromatic CCDs are probably still the best when it comes to deep sky imaging. Uh, the CMOS cameras, the new CMOS cameras, both color, uh, one-shot color and monochromatic uh, are also very good. I think the CCDs still have the edge, but it probably won't be that way for long. Um, and after that, it's a little bit difficult. It's going to come down to what telescope do you buy? What is the, uh, did we lose the YouTube feed? I hope not. I, I lost the YouTube feed. Um, I don't know if everybody else did. I don't, nope, I don't think so. Nope. Okay, um, cool. I've got four instances of the Astro Imaging channel running, so I was going to say something when you get finished here. Um, so if you're just starting out and from the question you're asking, it sounds to me like you're, you're kind of just starting out, um, a basic DSLR, you really can't go wrong with it. And, and in suggesting that, I hope that you, that you already have one, uh, because you really can do a lot with it. Um, after that you really have to decide whether it's if you decide not to go with a dslr whether it's planetary or deep sky there's some cameras that do both i'm not yeah I, i'm both not familiar enough with them and uh not uh experienced enough with them to really be able to comment or really want to comment on them hope that adam, helped adam yes um could i uh, the way that question was asked it sounds like somebody's saying, would somebody please explain to me what all this language is? I don't know how to buy the camera because there's all sorts of stuff, words out there. Um, we have gone to a lot of trouble in the Astro Imaging channel at one point or another to do shows about this. Um, if you go to theastroimagingchannel.com, I'm screen sharing, right? 
Yes. If, if you go to the Astro Imaging channel you, 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 right now, you're looking at, uh, well, I don't know what you're looking at. Uh, <laughs> we've got uh, past shows, which is the second column over. And if you go to past shows, uh, let's see, that's not it. There we go. Um, that's the one I wanted. Um, on page two, there's one called the Sensor Sense, the Sensor Sense Show, part one and part two. And it goes through all of the definitions of what to look for. Uh, and it defines what a pixel is and how it works and the filters and, and why the different kinds of cameras are what they, what they are. Uh, also, I think on the previous page here, although I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it, I've got a lot of junk going on here on the screen. Yeah, I lost it. Um, I, they'll be about which camera should I buy or what, what should I buy? And it, there's a, it's kind of a, um, yeah, what should I buy and how do I decide? Okay. These are, and there's lots and lots of other programs, but those are three programs that if you're just starting out and you don't know what to buy and all this gobbledygook is getting a little confusing for you, might be of an advantage for you to go to, okay? So I think that might be a good idea. Um, there's some, am I muted? Nope. Uh, there's some comments in chat. Yes, uh, people using the Nikon D810, uh, D810A. Uh, there are a lot of premium cameras out there, some dedicated astronomy DSLRs, uh, but they're a bit expensive. Uh, when it comes to DSLR photography, uh, for all but emission nebula, basically Canon's base model, Nikon's base model will do a really, really, really good job. And until you get up into probably uh, the, DA, the D810s uh, around that range, you're not gonna see much of a difference in image quality. And even then, the image quality difference is gonna be somewhat minuscule. Um, for deep sky, maybe maybe the better cameras will be a little bit better because they're good at, they're, they're, the, the newest sensors are actually really good at reducing noise, which is our primary concern. Um, but uh, calibration is really good at reducing noise. Stacking is really good at reducing noise. And uh, that's, that's kind of my overall, uh, my overall thought on that. I uh, wish I could be more helpful on that question. I see that 40 minutes have passed, and we haven't even gotten to the topic. What would you do differently about your setup? And I'm very happy with my gear. Um, I could use a new laptop, right? But I hate installing all those programs. I actually have tried new laptops. And for one reason or another, uh, somebody, uh, for one reason or another, some program didn't work and would cause issues. Uh, so I'm still using my 10 year old, probably 15 year old laptop because it all works. But that's not the thing I changed about my setup. I built myself an observatory. Uh, I built it right out here, downtown Scranton, uh, light pollution city. And you know, I, sh I should have built it in darker skies. Or even as opposed to that, maybe I should have just moved my whole system to like a rental pier. But uh, that's the one thing that always drives me nuts. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there in space. But when it comes to narrow band, when you've worked your way through uh, the hundred or so brightest objects out there, uh, you really start to think it'd be nice to hit some of these RGB objects. And um, it takes a drive. Uh, part of me wishes I had just put my remote observatory out there or, or sent my gear to, to New Mexico skies or something like that. That's the one thing I would change. Not, not anything about my gear, but the location. Anyone in the room have anything? Uh, what would you do differently? Or any just broad comments uh, kind of on that open discussion topic? Putting everyone on the spot, waiting to see a mute, uh, a microphone on mute. Maybe I picked a terrible topic. No, no, uh, I'll, I'll jump in here. So like you, Adam, I, I'm pretty happy with my current setup. Um, and there have certainly been decisions I've made in the past that um, weren't the best. Um, but 
I've always seen the decisions that I've made like that as uh, learning experiences. Sometimes the learning experiences came with a price tag that I wasn't necessarily happy with. Um, but for the most part, you know, you can learn from all those things uh, and make better informed decisions later on. Um, so there are things that I would have changed previously, but now with what I have, uh, I don't see changing anything at least for a while. Not not until I start trying to to shoot much smaller targets than I'm currently imaging. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, we've been we've all been. I don't know how long the channel's been on. Maybe three four years, uh, and and I know you've been doing it about as long as I have. David, and I feel like you learn a lot over time, and uh, just the channel's given us the opportunity to really refine our setups, and they're pretty darn well refined. Um, I, I can't, I see the other comment in, uh, in the chat now. Uh, the thing I want to change or the thing that I'm least unhappy with, uh, Mike Miller, is his at scope computer, right? Well, is that really part of your setup? I mean, I guess it is part of your setup, but, um, and, and I'm wondering why. Maybe it's some sort of uh, um, issue, like a hardware issue or a driver issue that happens, one of those gremlins that kind of affects those, uh, the computer. Uh, but, um, you know, it took us a while to get here, but we're here now, and uh, hey, I, the dream system. Go ahead, Sean. Can I add something? Go ahead. I started about a year and a half ago, and I spent way more money than I should have. And the reason is, is because I was so excited, and I wanted to learn this, and I wanted to get out there, and I wanted to create images like everybody else. But the, the, the stumbling block you run into when you start this is that there's no people to talk to. You have to go to tutorials on YouTube, and if you're lucky, you find a place like this where you can actually have a conversation. But for the most part, you're just wandering around in the dark out there. You pick up books, you read articles, you go to YouTube stuff. And so consequently, you spend money thinking you're doing the right thing, but then as you grow and you learn, you find out that, wow, I shouldn't have bought this and I shouldn't have bought this camera. And I shouldn't have done, I live in a light pollution and now I bought an OSC camera and I shouldn't have done that. And I should have gone narrow band. And, and all of this is something that you're going to get with time. And if I could give anybody that's starting out some advice, don't do I like I did settle down, take what you've got, work with it. It, it's hard because you're excited and you want to you want to do these things and you want to get these images. But as you grow and you learn, you're gonna you're gonna find out things that that you buy things that you're gonna you're gonna waste your money and your time on things because of lack of knowledge and lack of experience. The best thing to do is to get out there and shoot and find out what works and what doesn't work. And, and for anybody that's new that's listening to this, stick with a DSLR for right now and just, just go shoot it. And, and then when you get used to your capturing program and you get used to guiding and you get used to all the things that you're doing and you know how to work it, it'll come and you'll, you'll start to figure it out. But it's not something that's going to come fast and you'll end up spending a bunch of money that you don't have to. And I did that. And, and, and I don't recommend anybody do it. I sold so much stuff on Cloudy Nights. And if I had the money that I that I spent, I'd have the best mount, the best camera, and everything right now. But take your time, you know. It it, it it's gonna come, you know. So that's my piece. It's a good. It's words to live by. Um, resist the urge to buy something because it's cool. Save your money because you're gonna in this hobby. Comments uh, are lighting up. It's expensive, right? Um, you're going to need something at some point, whether it's a filter or uh, an adapter, uh, a spacer, uh, 
you're going to need something at some point, and you might as well save that budget for whatever it is you figure out uh, you need. Um, it's happened. A, a collimator, for that matter. You know, it's, everything's expensive. Uh, is there anything in the astronomy hobby that sells for five, ten dollars? No. Uh, and the more you spend, the better quality is, the more precision. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, the uh, I had to look it up. Kangaroo computer. It looks like it is a teeny palm size computer, desktop, mobile desktop computer, and I'm assuming it's mounted on top of his mount. Uh, that particular computer he's having issues with. I know a lot of us, um, shouldn't say me because I've still yet to get there, but uh, a lot of the people in the room uh, have done a pretty good job using uh, over-the-counter computers mounted on top of their mounts. Uh, maybe it's the manufacturer. I don't quite know. Uh, I, I think you said it crashed. It's a 12-volt computer. Uh, it, it overheats and randomly crashes. Um, sounds like it's an issue with the computer. I mean, if it overheats and crashes and it's 12 volt, I'd be sending it back. Uh, what could you be doing wrong? I mean, computers aren't supposed to overheat. Uh, I don't know. That, that'd be my opinion. Um, there are also, uh, We've had a show on it. Uh, I don't remember the particular brand, but there's a number of brands of these computers. Intel is making them. Uh, Intel makes the Nook, uh, which I believe now comes in a smaller form factor. Intel also makes the PC Stick, which may be uh, too underpowered for what we're doing, but I know some people have been experimenting with them. Um, but I wouldn't, uh, definitely wouldn't completely forego uh, the uh, idea of a mount, of a, of a OTA mounted laptop, or excuse me, OTA mounted computer. Um, yeah, because it says, because it, it has no fan, it just dies when you try to use it. I mean, think about this though, the, the, Tablets are pretty well powered these days. The uh, my Surface right here, uh, I don't know what's in it, but pretty well powered, right? Um, no fan on this. So if if this was overheating, I'd return it. Um, so I don't I, I I don't think the fact that it's a small PC uh, makes up for the fact that it overheats. If there's something wrong with it. Uh, send it back and tell them there's something wrong with it. Um, I think you would, another brand would work perfectly well for you. Um, Adam? Yes. Uh, Elias had some questions. He looks like he's building an observatory. Uh, can we take some time to answer them now? Yes. Okay. Um, he was asking um, what he should be working towards, a peer? or a tripod on the base of his observatory. And um, this was an issue on cloudy nights. There was a, a thread on it not too long ago. And seriously, once you go to an observatory, you're only gonna have so much room inside that observatory. It's best if you don't have tripod legs there. Also, a pier is inherently more stable assuming you build a proper size pier. Now, to build a proper size pier and get it to really work, you really want it anchored to the sub ground, not to the floor. Remember we talked a little bit earlier in the show about how even walking around on a floor transfers vibration to your view. You don't want that to happen. What the ideal situation is, and not everybody can do this, but the ideal situation is to dig a hole about 40 inches deep, and depending on your, your frost conditions and stuff like this, it's very, but you dig a big hole, and down at the bottom of that hole, you got a bulb of concrete, a big old blob of, a globular of, of concrete down there, okay? And then it kind of starts coming up, and then at some point, 
you switch from that concrete to a steel pier, a continue your concrete pier, or whatever you're going to do. Um, so that's step one. And then you isolate that blob of concrete, that foundation of concrete down there um, with some foam or there's various materials that you can do this. And then you go ahead and you pour your concrete slab if that's what you want to do. Many people use a wooden floor over that. Uh, there's various ways you can do that. But the whole point is that whatever floor you're walking on is not at all attached to your pier or your pier base. And then you want a pier coming up from that. That would be the ideal situation. Are there places for compromise? Sure, there's always cost and everything else. And Lesur, who is one of the premier manufacturers of, of piers, says that if you've got a thick enough slab, you can go ahead and, and put some anchor bolts in there and put one of their beautiful piers on, the, on, the, on a slab of concrete. But I really wouldn't want to buy those kinds of problems if I could help it. So, um, uh, Elias, I hope that answers your question. What you're looking for is a pier, a pier that's put on a base. If you go up to Lesur, L-E-S-E-U-R, Google that, L-E-S-E-U-R, and look to see what they suggest for installing a pier, that's what you want to do. You want to pour a big blob of concrete and so forth and so on. Um, now, how do you attach the mount to the top of the pier? Um, look, most of us went down to the junkyard and bought a big old piece of, of pipe. And we took it over, we, we know how to weld, we welded it ourselves, or we took it over to the local machine shop and we, we got them to machine it together, weld it together, whatever it is. And so all we've got is a piece of steel. But at the top of this piece of steel now is your question. You need, uh, in my case, I put a flat top on it. And on top of that flat top, I got a pier adapter plate from Astrophysics. They make them so that their, their bottom is a flat plate that has three bolt holes and those three bolt holes go right into the top of this flat plate at the top of your pier. And the top part of that adapter plate that they sell matches whatever uh, mount that you have. Uh, Los Mondi's got, everybody's got them. Okay. And they, you, you, they, that's basically all you need to do is something like that. I've, I've made them out of wood uh, in certain cases. I've made them out of uh, scrap metal. I handy enough with a mill that I can, you know, make some of these things up. Um, but basically all you're looking for is a good solid metal connection, a good solid connection between one and the other. And as long as you know what the two of them look like, anybody can make them and you can probably buy them all over the place. But there is such a thing called a, a, a mount adapter plate that allows you to do that kind of stuff. Now, um, most of the sophisticated mounts, um, the more expensive mounts is another way to say that, have holes along the side of the base. Some of the less expensive have a, a bolt that comes up through the bottom. When you got a bolt that comes up through the bottom, it's a little harder to mount it, but it can all be done. It's been done before. All you gotta do is look into it. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, if you are looking for a manufacturer, Dan's Pure Plates, uh, yeah. he does a great job of them. They are they are pricey, but when you see them in person, you you can kind of understand why. Um, he also uh, sells the bolts, which uh, I I mean I know it's not hard to uh, run to. Yeah, PurePlates.com. Not hard to run to Lowe's and buy some um, J bolts or anchor bolts or whatever you may be, but it's nice to be able to buy them from one place and not really have to worry about any of that stuff. Uh, and to, he sells them for all different types of mounts. Okay, we already got that one answered then. I was gonna say if CGS has a one of those, if you've got one of those with a bolt that comes up from the bottom that you screw up tight, what you do is you buy the pier plate, you stick it on, you bolt it on, and then the pier plate itself goes down on the top of your pier. Okay, notice center bolt, okay, cool. Yep, and apprehensive about starting the project. I understand that. I was apprehensive before I started mine. And uh, the hardest thing was starting. Uh, once I chopped down that bush out there, though, I had to do it. I had to finish it, right? Because I the chopped other, down all those bushes. The, the other thing is realize, yeah, you're going to screw it up. But 
but think of it like this. The Astro Imaging Channel, the folks at Cloudy Nights, we're all one big family and we're here to help. And like any big brothers or big sisters, we'll be patient with you. We'll stand there with you. We'll answer your questions. I mean, as soon as we stop laughing at you, um, we'll help you as much as we can. So go ahead and take those steps. It's easy enough to do. Now the pier could be very cheap. Concrete's cheap. I, I don't know where you're from, so I don't know your frost level, uh, which would probably determine exactly how much concrete you need. It might require a truck. It probably requires a truck. Uh, but if, if for some reason you're, at, okay, so for example, I'm on bedrock. Uh, I would uh, I would have been able to use okay 36 inches. Yeah, you're gonna have a 36 by uh, you're gonna have uh, what a 42 by 36 by 36 slab with a pier coming out of it. Um, it's a lot of concrete for me. I think what maybe three four hundred dollars. Uh, you're not you're you're not even paying for the concrete. You're paying for oh you live in Philly nearby. Yeah, you're not paying for the concrete. You're paying for the guy to drive to your to your house, basically. Um, I think I think mine was like three or four hundred dollars. Uh, That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, construction been construction needs will vary depend on your uh, well depend on your demands. Okay, uh, if you've got bedrock. You can yeah, you get yourself a, a drill, a hammer drill, and you can epoxy in some um, bolts and be done with it. Yep. Y you know, it all depends on on your situation. But don't be scared about the price. Um, uh, you can always just buy bags down at the down at the Home Depot and come home and do it slowly. But you can you can get it done yourself. It, it can all be done. Um, so, uh, okay. So 1030, I, I hope we covered all those questions. Well, the, the topic of the night, we didn't really go over much, but, uh, I think by covering the other questions, we really covered a lot of ground and helped some people out. Uh, next week I will repeat myself. Warren Keller, easy as pie, easy as PI. Uh, we are, uh, Warren's been on in the past. Warren, uh, does a great job every time he's on, really knows a lot about Pix Insight, but probably better than just knowing a lot about Pix Insight. Um, he knows how to uh, talk about it, dare I say, dumb it down so that we can understand it. Um, His IP for AP site is great, and it's only a couple of bucks a month. And I, I tell anybody, if you want to learn to use Pix Insight, Pay the five, six bucks a month and get on that site. There's everything you need to learn Pixon site, and he's great at teaching. There, there's also some spaces left in his um, Buffalo Wings. Um, no, he's got a, a workshop coming up in early May. Uh, and uh, if you go to his website, you can sign on. I think it was $5.95 for three days with um, the, him and Ron Beckler. So, um, you know. Sign on for that if you're, you're uh, Warren's a good guy, and um, he's like yeah. the Mr. Rogers of Pix and Sight when you hear him. Pardon, <laughs> he's like the Mr. Rogers on Pix and Sight, he talks real yeah. slow, real easy. No, he, he doesn't. He in real great. life, he like talks like a human being, yeah, it's no, 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 only on those silly videos that he does that. On his videos, he takes his time and to where everybody can understand it and you can learn it. You don't have to pause. You can just keep listening and go. He's, he does a great job. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's just in real life, he, he really talks like a regular human being. <laughs> I can't awesome. believe the show's over already. That was fast. Yeah, we fly through them. I don't know. The, the open sessions, I, I kind of like them. Uh, I wish we had content dedicated. Are we still to live? We are still live. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I wish we had dedicated content uh, or a dedicated presentation for every. We need presenters to get the dedicated contact, guys. Exactly. Girls uh, and ladies. I, 
I did get a couple suggestions. Uh, I got a couple suggestions for questions. I got a couple suggestions for presenters. I will reach out to the presenters uh, and hopefully they could be on. I know it seems like a lot of these people that are being suggested to me are in a terrible time zone to present for us. Some of them uh, brave the 4 a.m. Uh, alarm and uh, help us out. Uh, but I understand if you can't. But yeah, looking for presenters always. Still a great show tonight, though. Yep. Adam, you want to sign off? What's that? You want to sign off? We're still live. Yes, I'm going to sign off. I just wanted to, Alex. Was the uh, Buffalo thing the one, the thing that you wanted to talk about? Uh, we've got it. There was a last question about whether you should put a pier or a tripod on a slab. I'd gotcha. avoid the slab, like I said, and I, I, I've answered it. Gotcha. Thank you, guys. Good night. Uh, next week. Warren Keller.